Hello, David Ansari here of the Center for Risk Analysis. We help you to understand the risks in the present environment, to prepare for an uncertain future and to prosper tomorrow. Now we've just heard the president's address announcing that South Africa will be moving from lockdown level two to lockdown level one. What does this mean exactly? To tell us more, I'm joined by Nicholas Babaya, who's an analyst in the CRA team, who's gonna give us his first impressions. Nicholas, welcome to the channel. Yes, thank you, David. Uh, the main announcement tonight, of course, was that the country is moving from level two down to alert level one. Uh, this will entail inevitably the chopping away and trimming of a few of the lockdown restrictions, things like restrictions on alcohol, uh, and perhaps one of the main things being the allowing of international visitors to come to South Africa. Uh, but the important thing to realize is that the state of national disaster is still very much in place. The government still very much has the power to make regulations on an ad hoc basis. And this will be the way at least for another month unless they um, renew it again. And so business in the country should uh, not celebrate too soon. Yes, Nick. And there are still some residual regulations all the way back from lockdown level five uh, that could still be enforced, even if they are not enforced directly at the moment. They're still uh, representing a latent risk there. So, for example, the spreading of fake news around, uh, around covid uh, that could still incur a sanction or penalty. All right, so Nicholas, I want to just focus somewhat on the issue around international travel and the impact that this will have on tourism. See, seems that uh, South Africa is now gradually going to be opening its borders, but that doesn't seem to be a wholesale reopening. And there are some risks that you have identified there. What are those exactly? Well, I think the first risk is that presently we do not know which nationalities will actually be allowed into South Africa. So, of course, South Africa is a country that benefits a lot from tourism. We've got a large sector in the country that is based primarily off tourism or is simply a tourism sector, things like touring. Uh, if you think about all the private game farms in the country, all of this is, is based on uh, foreign travelers. However, these people don't come from any country around the world. They come from certain select countries. So, um, I think before uh, the tourism sector celebrates, I think we should wait and see which uh, nationalities the government allows in. Uh, and I think one should be very careful just to see that there's not a bit of uh, political motivations when taking these sorts of decisions. The president announced that this will be based off the number of cases or the scientific evidence, uh, is I think the term that he used, of given countries around the world. And so I think we should hold him to that and, and really scrutinize uh, what um, comes of this opening up of international travel to South Africa. So Nicholas, the president announced also that testing procedures are going to be expanded and there's going to be a rollout of much more testing. But what we've seen across various countries in South Africa is the more tests you do, the more cases you detect. And we've identified that there might be a risk of a mistaken second wave that this is looks like a resurgence of COVID when in fact it is just identifying latent uh, infections that have been already uh, in existence within the population. Uh, what would you say about that risk? Yes, so there have been many countries around the world, particularly I would say in Europe and a few others elsewhere who have seen what is apparently a second wave this is just a second increase in cases after an initial peak declines. Um, in South Africa, we took a much longer amount of time to get to our peak. So perhaps it's a little less likely here. But one thing that should be noted is that this is inevitably the result of simply doing more testing. So if you actually go and look at the percentage of tests uh, that come out positive, you see that the second wave is more illusory than anything. It's simply what happens is the country reaches its peak, it tests fewer people, and then suddenly it starts testing more people again when once it has more resources and then all of a sudden we have this apparent second wave. Uh, a good way to have a look at this is compare the number of tests the countries have been doing over time and another one and I think this is very important is to compare deaths. So a lot of the times you see these big second waves in many European countries um, but this does not correlate to a second wave in terms of deaths. You see I think quite a few of the death curves just laying flat. Now, the president has announced that because we now have more medical resources, we will be increasing our testing. And I think that it is therefore almost inevitable that we're going to see a second wave. I could be wrong, but if we do see a second wave, once again, this should be really scrutinized within the context of the data and the fact that we are testing more people. Uh, one thing uh, we would advise, I would say, 
is to look at the percentage of tests done that come out as positive. That number has been very gradually decreasing since the peak of the pandemic in South Africa. And that, if anything, is the most important number, along with, of course, the number of deaths. Uh, after all, all of this, uh, the purpose of all of this is to, in fact, save life. And we should not take our eye off the ball on that one. Nicholas, the difference between lockdown level two and lockdown level one doesn't seem very substantive. We've had Pete LaRue of Business for Ending Lockdown earlier in the week on the CRA channel openly calling for the withdrawal of the lockdown protocols and the removal of the state of disaster. Uh, it, it seems that there is a strong push now uh, amongst uh, organizations like that to just remove the lockdown protocols altogether. Uh, do you think that this is basically de facto uh, a lifting of the lockdown? No, I don't think so. Although to a very large extent, most manners of commerce in South Africa will be able to continue in some sense. The fact of the matter is the most important thing is that we still have a state of disaster on. And this gives the government a large degree of discretionary power to make regulations on an ad hoc basis. Now, we should be reminded that at times, this government does have ideological and political motivations for doing so. I think perhaps the great ex example of this was that shopping list of clothing which uh, the Minister Ibrahim Patel made uh, on, on what kind of clothes you can buy. Uh, and the fact that e-commerce for a long time was banned and the basis for this had nothing to do with the pandemic itself. It was so, if, so that other businesses that were not e-commerce would have fair competition. At least that was according to Ibrahim Patel. So this is still a big problem. The fact that the government still has this amount of discretionary power. And on top of this, the president really emphasized tonight that this is the new normal. And I think you're starting to see this atmosphere from many government officials that they want the country to just kind of get used to living like this until we have a vaccine one day. And that may still be quite far in the future. Um, so I think the point to take away here is that don't celebrate just yet. Uh, you know, we're not out of the woods yet. And I'm not referring necessarily to the pandemic. I'm referring to the lockdown. The government still has a large amount of discretionary power. And the way in which they've cut away some of these regulations is really quite superficial. I mean, for example, now the, the, the curfew has been pushed back a couple of hours from now it's at midnight to 4 a.m. Who, who exactly, what, is, what exactly does, is the purpose of that curfew now? It seems to make very little sense. But I think part of this is sending a bit of a political message that, you know, we still control you guys. I hate to be cynical like that. But, uh, you know, when looking at the ideological leanings of the ANC, uh, this certainly does fit nicely into that puzzle. All right, Nick. And I think the, the risk there, as you've identified, is that this idea of the new normal will be used as a justification for the expansion of state control and ever greater centralization, as we've seen under the, the lockdown. So that's it from us at the Center for Risk Analysis. Please do join us tomorrow at 7 a.m. And if you like this video, please do give it a like and share it on your various social media platforms. Do check out the 30-day free trial. There's a link in the description below. Until tomorrow, take care.